Everybody say, God bless for the acorn. They said, they said, well, where's this Bible? They said, where's this Bible? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Ain't God good? Amen. Not too loud, am I? Well, here's my Bible. No, my Bible's back there. But this came from my Bible. The Bible came from parchments, so on and so forth. I mean, is this just another cop? This is just a copy of what's in my Bible. Amen. Because I can't, you know, flip through there. I'll take too much of your time if I did that, okay? Now, if I get, I don't want to get too loud, okay? Because I got a strong voice. I'm sorry. I just use it over the years, and I've tried to. I tried to overcome this Cajun accent. I just cannot do it. Amen. I'm sorry. This is East Texas. But you know, God has been good. You know what? Can you hear me, Mama? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Pretty good. <clears throat> Brother Selena said, put a little higher and then talk a little better. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you, brother. Okay. I want to be sure that I don't uh, take too much of your time. because God has done what he wanted to do. But, the, but that's not all he wants to do, you know. Because uh, God, uh, I believe that the, all that's necessary. But the word of God is really what's going to take you to heaven. All this here is going to take you to. This is a, an, an addition to what... The Word of God does it because that's what the Word of God talks about, you know, Amen. praying and worshiping. And, and um, I really, you know how I am. I'm, I'm always get up here and I stumble around and get apologetic and all that kind of stuff. It's because I'm trying to be humble, okay? I, I, I learned humility the hard way, okay? The Bible says the humble, see, if you're humble, see, God can help you. If you're not humble, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, he, you're in trouble. And I, and I learned it the hard way. And I, sometimes I... I fail to be humble. I'm like, brother, rap some time old people cut me off the car. I said, idiot. You know, you know, it's just, it's just that habit. We've got to watch that. And I, I have really learned to watch that. It's just, it's just normal. You know what I mean? It's a normal human re reaction there. And I, and, uh, but it's not good, you know. It's, we've got to give account for every word that we say. Yeah. Every idle word shall be accounted for. Every, not only idle word, but idle words are words that don't amount to anything, right? And, uh, so if you go ahead and stand and turn, I'd like you to turn to St. Luke. I go, go and get into the Word and not try to hold you too long here tonight. <clears throat> and I move out of the way. God has done His work, but now He's going to instill a little Word in your heart. Yes. And I'll reread St. Luke 19, uh, verses 41 through 44. All right. Starting with verse 41. I'll wait, give you just a, a minute there. I want everybody to have it if you don't have the word. And my good brother back here really believes in the word, my brother Timothy. Amen. He really believes in, in the word. I know he does, and I appreciate that. I bring my Bible with me, even though this is up here, I still, because some folks, I might can see this, but I think can turn the Bible fast enough. But I'll give you enough time, hopefully. Okay, St. Luke 19, 41 through 44. Now I'll let you sit down. And, and when he was come near, he beheld the city, talking about Jesus, and wept over it. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass, compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Would you pray, Pastor Ratter? Praise the Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us, God. Thank you, Lord. What you've done here this Glory to your name. We need your word. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I had, uh, my brother John asked me sometime back about speaking uh, tonight. I, uh, I had another, something on my mind I thought about teaching. Cause I'm, I'm, not, I'm used to teaching, not trying to preach, okay? I, I liked it back on, when we said before, so like on Wednesday, 
So every once in a while on Wednesday, we kind of get into teaching. That seemed like the regular teaching type, you know, night. To me, it does. Midweek Bible study and stuff like that. But, but you know, God led me in another, a different direction, which is unusual for me, I'd say. I was in my house, and I was, normally I sit in my chair there, and, I, and I, we read every day. And if we somehow or another get busy, which we try not to get so busy, you can't read your Bible. But it happens at times. You know, well, we always catch it up the next day or later on, or whatever like that. But we sit there and we read our Bibles and discuss things. And, and, uh, and uh, matter of fact, my wife wasn't even in there. At this particular time, I think she had already read and was doing something else. And I was, I was working on this here and studying. I did not know what I was working on, actually. I wasn't actually working on this. But uh, something came to my mind while I was sitting there. And, uh, and as I sat in my chair thinking about this particular subject, does it say it right there? The ultimate rejection. This thought came into my mind, and I, and, and be honest with you, tears flowed down my eyes as I sit in my chair, just sitting there. I know, I'm not just sitting there, thinking about, Lord, what, what do you want me to, to speak on? You know, you know how it is. You go here and you go there and you look at this and well, this looks good and I, I've got I've got lessons I've had. I could always bring another one back up. You know, do you like that old cow? You know what a cow does? The cow's got two stomachs. Did you know that? Some of those country folks know that. I'm not really a country folk, but my wife is. She was raised on a, on a farm there in Lamp Pass, and I was raised in the city. I'm a city dude, city slick. But anyway, I learned this stuff over the years. Now, a cow has two stomachs. So what they do, they chew stuff there, and then uh, they have what they call the old cow. Later on, they'll chew something, and they'll, later on, they'll belch it up and chew on it again. They call it chewing the cud. So after the preacher gets through, when you go home tomorrow, you're on your job, just, just bring it back up and chew on it, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. Be like that old cow. Hey, Amen. We're all cattle. The Lord's cattle. He owns all the cattle on the thousand hill. We just like cattle, okay? But uh, amen. So just bring it back up and chew on it a while. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, and, I, and as I lay, sit there in my chair there, and I begin to think about this here, and, and I thought about this, this, this subject of rejection, all of us in our life have suffered rejection at one time or another from somebody, somewhere, or something, whether it's our job, whether it's our wife, whether it's our husband, whether it's our children, whatever it is, we have all suffered and experienced this thing called rejection. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing to be rejected. And I think about my life. I don't, I'm not going to say much about my life. I have in the past already. I felt totally rejected at that time when I was in the orphanage, and I just and things would happen, and and uh, and uh, I'd have nightmares and uh, scare the life out of me, so to speak, and, uh, and I had no one to go to. I had no one. I didn't have a dad or a mom to go to. I didn't. And I but 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 I just had to sit there and just do. The, uh, lo- I was lonely. You know. You ever been lonely? Man. You ever felt rejected from somebody? And you and you felt lonely. Your kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, sometimes your children just, you know, wander off like this here. Sometimes parents. And I've told y'all more than one time. I, and I saw my mother and I was almost 12 years old. For the first time I can remember. Almost 12 years old. But nonetheless, don't feel sorry for me. God has helped me. But I begin to think about this, uh, this rejection. And in these scriptures, we have a picture of Jesus as he lamented over Jerusalem. There he was. You see him. Get the picture in your mind. Standing there, looking over Jerusalem and weeping. Because of rejection. They rejected him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And he was not fooled or influenced by the enthusiasm of the mob of people that had come to welcome him to the city. He was not influenced by that. He knew what was going on. He could see by, beyond a lot of things, especially the religious people of his day. He could see beyond that. He understood past that. He knew what was going on. Yeah. He, he knew they were rejecting him all this time. Uh, the picture is one of Jesus being overcome of emotion following the months or years of preparation for a ministry whose terrible climax would take place right there. He spent all this time preparing for a ministry that was going to end right there where he was. Amen. In Jerusalem. He knew he was destined to give his life at Jerusalem. Amen. Here it all started and here it would all end. Right there. He knew that. Yet, there's still time for them to repent. But Jesus knows that comparatively few will make use of this opportunity. Very few will make use of this opportunity and repent and turn from this rejection in their heart that they had towards their Savior. 
Instead, they would refuse to listen to the one sent from God. They just absolutely refused to listen. The city that for so long had rejected God's messengers over the years is no longer capable of discerning or recognizing its redemptive last chance. They were unable to recognize that that was their, actually their last chance. Some of them, many of them. They were unable to see clearly through the thick darkness of their unbelief. Now, I, just put all, I didn't get that out of the book. I just put all this down when I was sitting in my chair. And God was, my, I was sitting there crying, weeping in my chair. And all this stuff began to come into my mind, you know. Is that the way it works? That was supposed to work, I guess. He's been preaching a lot longer than I have. And I, I, I love my pastor. I love Brother John and everybody. Yeah. Brother John, can I just say that I'll move on to my message. Brother John, bless his heart. He's always trying to build me up and help me and encourage me about this wisdom thing. <laughs> I don't have a lot of wisdom. I've got a lot of experience. But I tell you, I fall short on wisdom. Here's your wisdom right here. And him and his son, amen, and his wife and his family, stuff like that. They're the ones that got the church, not me. Wisdom put this thing together, you know. Wisdom and obedience put this thing together, not me. I, I, didn't, I don't even belong up here, really. I, I don't. But they gave me an opportunity, so here I am. God bless you, so you'll have to put up with me. To feel the Lord is beginning wisdom, you know that. If you don't feel the Lord, you don't have no wisdom. They could not understand that the only hope that they had of escaping eternal separation from God was standing among them and speaking to them. Amen. God was offering them a, a lifeline of hope. Like they were in the, in the quicksand, he would offer them, that was a lifeline of hope. Come out of it. Come out of it. Come out of it. You know? <clears throat> the master knew that everything he said was the most, for the most part was falling on deaf ears. Ears that were dull of hearing after years of unbelief and hearts that had turned to stone. Hearts that had literally turned to stone. Just refused to hear what he had to say. Amen. Jesus was well aware of the scriptures in Isaiah 53 and 3. That spoke prophetically of him in these ominous words. This is what it said. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. They hid their, actually hid their faces from him in rejection. Amen. The word despised comes from the Greek word, which is balzal, which means to scorn as a vile person. They actually looked upon their, their master, their Messiah, their Savior as a vile person. They saw him as vile, something that they, get away from us. We, we don't want this. The Bible says his visage. His appearance, his visage, was so marred more than any man's. And that's why they streamed him. They actually thought he was smitten and cursed of God. They did. His visage, his appearance, was so marred. The Bible said more than any man. I mean, they beat him. You hear what I'm telling you? They beat this man. They put the thorn in the crown. We know the story. I'm not trying to play with your sympathy. I'm telling you. I'm telling you about an ultimate, ultimate rejection. I'm going to get to your heart tonight. I hope I can, really, I hope I can reach your heart tonight Amen. In some, with something. Amen. So it means to scorn as a vile person. To scorn someone is to reject them. To look down on them, to see them as an unclean thing. That's what you do when you despise someone and you scorn someone. And we can't be scorning anybody. Amen. Regardless of if, it's a, if he's on Skid Row or wherever he is. We used to go to Skid Row when I lived in Houston back through the church. My wife and I didn't want to go down there and talk to people on Skid Row down there. Years ago in Houston, Texas. A terrible place. That's why I said, because I mentioned before, Houston's a terrible place. Wow. Amen. It's, just, it's to cast them aside as a worthless thing. You count them as worthless. Amen. To reject someone. In verse 4 of this same chapter, Isaiah 53 and verse 4, we read, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him, esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Many of the people in Jesus' time actually believed that he was a, they actually believed he was a curse of God. They actually believed that. Why? And, and this view of him was reinforced when they saw him on the cross that was made from a tree. This view they had of him was reinforced. They really thought, oh, he's hanging on the tree. The Bible says curses everyone that's hanging on the tree. Look here, he's hanging on the tree. So they really thought he was smitten of God, cursed of God. Amen. Amen. So the worst thing they could do to him was to hang him on a tree trying to prove to the people that indeed this man was truly cursed of God. That's why they hung him on the tree. To try to prove that, hey, this man's cursed with God. They had to, see. They, they, they tried to, con they tried to uh, uh, make their self feel, how you say, I can't 
I can't think of the word. They're trying to justify themselves, I guess, in what they were doing. But, excuse me, Jesus knew what it was to be rejected. Even his own siblings didn't believe in him. Rejection is as old as Adam and Eve, the very first ones to choose Satan, Satan's cunning words and reject God's command. It's old as Adam and Eve. Rejection is. Amen. So, Satan's ultimate goal is for the complete rejection of God by humanity. That's his ultimate goal is to get the whole world to reject God and his plan. That's his ultimate goal is rejection of God. Amen. And it seems, almost seems to me like we're getting pretty close to that right now. If you look around you, we're getting close. They're they really trying to just cut Christianity out. I mean, really just do away with Christianity. Those people there, they, they're crazy. I'm telling you, I read my paper. I'm, I'm, I'm a mature and adult. I know how to read a paper and you know, understand what's going on. And try, I try to keep up with the time and see what's going on and see, try to see God in things. But I don't see God in too much. I do see the devil in things. I see devil in everything, you know what I mean? I'm telling you, you would be surprised. You would be surprised at what they put in there. People coming on this would seem like a hatred, such a total hatred and rejection of Christianity as a whole. It's just in, in the speeches. I want some time to sit down and write. I, I do a lot of writing. I write stuff, man. I'm a prolific writer. I write. I got stuff. You wouldn't believe it. I write, 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 write. I don't ever do anything with it. It's what it is. I write a lot. I get messages. I just write. I just write, write. And I, sometimes I want to sit down. I want to write to those people, those that, that, that write these articles in these papers here to the editor and stuff like that and say these things. I just want to write them and say, uh, you need to get in your Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I leave it alone. The Bible said, he that warreth entangles himself not with the affairs of this world. They may be a good soul of him that called him. So, you, so if I'm going to war, be a warrior for Christ, I don't want to get entangled too much in that stuff. People get entangled in stuff like that. You, you get entangled in stuff you ain't supposed to get entangled in. Okay. Well, where am I at? Okay. So here we are. At one time in the history of the Jewish nation, we read in the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel, where the elders of Israel came together and asked that they be given a king to rule over them. You know the story. Like the nations around them. And in verse 7, 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, we read. That's 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not rule over them. That's what the people don't want, the Lord to rule over them. I remember, I'll just slip this in, I don't have it down here, back in Houston when I was running a machine shop down there back in the 70s. I was right around the farm and then I run a big flange shop, they made pipe flanges for the oil field and stuff like that. And, um, Boss coming there one day, he told me all machines. I, I, I don't want you on the machine. <clears throat> I want you in here. You know so much about these flanges. I've been doing them several years. I want you in this office in here. I want you kind of breaking blueprints down, make sure everything's okay, and answering questions. Da da da. I did that for a while, and next thing you know, the, my foreman told me, Jesse, named Jesse I. Bear, a Spanish guy. Well, he said, "You know what, Alton?" He said, uh, "These people accept you out there on the machine, but they don't accept you in this office in here." I've had that problem everywhere I went, living for God. I worked at Fort Hood and Range Control for 10 years. I was a work leader out there on the range. I should have never took the position, but it paid a little bit more money, so I, hey, I needed to support my family, you know. I took the position over three years. I was a work leader at Fort Hood, Range Control out there, and uh, working with retired soldiers, retired sergeants, retired warrant officers. Warrant officers give me a fit, and first sergeant gave me a fit, you know what I mean? But I was over them. I actually, believe it or not, and I, wouldn't even, I just put three years in. I wasn't even really a military man. But anyway, but they wouldn't accept me. They just, they, they just flat rejected me. They fought me. Every way I turned, every way I turned, they were trying to tear me down, trying to backstab me, doing all kinds of stuff. They did, did this to me. You know what I mean? Why? I was rejected because I had God in me. You know? I was rejected. Finally, I just give it up. You know? All right. Okay. So they had not rejected Samuel, God told them. They rejected me. Okay. Centuries later, we find Jesus speaking with his disciples in St. Mark 8.31. Mark 8.31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He speaks of rejection. Okay? All right. In St. Matthew 10.37. Using several scriptures here, if you don't mind. Matthew 10, 37, we read, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter is more, uh, more than me is not worthy of me. 
I've seen this very thing take place in my lifetime. Sister Acar and I, when we come to God back in 1966, begin to read the Bible and study and search, search for answers and things. And we came to a place where we had to make a choice. We had to make a choice between our family and God. If our family don't want to live for God, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about families that don't want to live for God. We had to put God ahead of our own children. And we were rejected. Not by God. We were rejected by our children. To this day. Oh, they come around. We shouldn't be like that. Yet. But as, as a whole, as gen generally speaking, we've been rejected by our family. But, but we had to make that choice. You had to make that choice. If your children stand, in, I'm just talking, okay, from my heart. If children stand and come between you, God, and you've got to make a choice, you're going to have to choose God or your children, one or the other. Because they will lead you off into, into the wrong place. Amen. That's right. That's correct. And we've seen this. All right. Rejection is like, it's like freedom. It comes with a cost. It comes with a cost. To serve God and be rejected, that's your cost right there. See, that's part of the cost. That's part of your cross. Did you know, Jesus say you had to take up your cross and follow me? That's part of your cross. Amen. If you can't do that, and I'm sure some of you made the same uh, fateful choice. In one way, it's hard to understand, yet the more we come to know about God, the more we can understand why it has to be this way. The more you learn about God, the more, the more you understand. Because he was rejected for centuries and, and still being rejected for centuries and running down the line. It's one, thing, it's one thing to reject God. It's quite another thing to be rejected of God. And that's where I'm going. It's one thing to reject God. You go ahead and reject God, but there's going to come a day when you're going to be rejected. I'm leading there. Job felt rejected by God. And we read in Job 23, 8 and 10, 8 through 10. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, and I cannot perceive him. I can't find him. Hallelujah. On the left hand where it doth work. He, Job said, I'm, I'm, over, I'm looking over here. Where is he? You ever felt that way? You ever felt that way, Jeremiah? You say, well, God, I know. I, I believe in God. I know God. God's done something for me. But where is he? Sometimes it seems like God done hid from me. I go over here. I say, God, are you over here? Job said, I go to my right hand, my left hand. He said, but he's not there. I believe it was 39, 37, 39 chapter, 30, 30 something chapter. All the time that Job suffered, God was hidden from him. It's just like he had rejected him. He felt rejected this whole time. Where are you, God? He cried, where are you? I go, to, I go here. I look, I search, I can't find him. I've been there. Sometimes I said, well, God, where are you? Why is this happening? What's going on? Where are you? I did a message years ago down there in Kirbyville, and I was going to church down before I retired down there. When God hides. God sometimes does hide. He does. He hides sometimes. But it's for a reason. He wants you to come find him. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, I was found of them later on that sought me not. Talking about a Gentile. We wouldn't even look for I wasn't looking for God in 1966 at the age of 26. I wasn't looking for God. Amen. I was busy doing my job, just going on whatever, you know, I could do like that there. But I found him. I wasn't even looking for him. We found him. He wasn't looking for him. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. For, yeah, here it is. For 37 chapters, for 37 chapters, while Job suffered and felt rejected by God, God said nothing. He said nothing. Nothing. He never heard a thing. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, Job said, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he try, hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's where we are, friend. That's where we are, brother. That's where we are. We've got to come forth as gold after he's tried us. Amen. Have you ever felt that way? God, where are you? You look here, you look there, you search here, you know, you just can't seem to find, you can't seem to feel his presence. Where are you, Lord? Isaiah 45, 15 says, Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself. That's Isaiah 45, 15 for those looking in the Bible. I'm sorry. Uh, verily thou art a God that hideth thyself, as what he said, a God of Israel, the Savior. O God of Israel, the Savior. <laughs> he said he hides himself. It is amazing. Hallelujah. There are times in our Christian walk that it really seems like God is playing hide and seek with us, doesn't it? It seems like he's playing hide and seek. You ever played hide and seek? I used to play hide and seek. I hated it. All right. But he's not going anywhere. You got to understand, God hadn't gone anywhere. 
Hallelujah. God's omnipresent and manifestation of his presence. And listen real close. Let me say it again. Go slow. God's omnipresence and manifestation of his presence are two different things. All right? One is a fact. God's omnipresence is a fact, undisputable, indisputable fact. You can't change it. God's omnipresence, God means that he's everywhere. That is a fact. But the other is a feeling. His presence, hallelujah, is a feeling. And sometimes we seek the wrong thing. Sometimes we seek a feeling when we go to church instead of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Is this okay, Pastor? Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. God is always present even when you are unaware of him. Yeah. He's always present yeah. even though you don't feel him. And his presence is too profound to be measured by mere or just emotion. God's presence is too profound to just try to measure him by what I feel or what you feel. You can't measure God by just what you feel. Hallelujah. It's not about what you feel. Now, I'm not talking about the initial feel what you feel, the Holy Ghost, when you're baptized and all this kind of I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about later on in life, you're living for God, you come to church, oh, I don't feel God. I don't feel God. I went, I went to church and then went home and didn't feel God. It's not about what you feel. I'm sorry. It's not about what I feel. Sometimes I feel, I feel like he's 100 miles away, 1,000 miles away. But he wants us to trust him even if we don't feel him. Because he's always there. He hasn't went anywhere. He's always there. He's always there. See, his omnipresence, like I said, is a fact and not a feeling. It's a fact. His presence is a feeling. Two different things. Amen. Faith and not feeling is what pleases God. Faith pleases God, not feelings. Amen. Amen. And we can at times feel like God has rejected us because we don't necessarily feel his presence like we want to, like we once did, you know. I got a deal. I'm going to wind up in a little bit. I got a deal on, on, on worship about that, but I'm, I'm not going to bring that in. I just had that as a side note. Now, Hebrews 13 and 5. I'm fixing close. Told you I wouldn't hold you long. I'm, I'm trying to be a man of my word. Amen. I don't lose the interest, you know. Okay, in Hebrews 13 and 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Oh, there's a problem right there. And be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said it. Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it. He said it. I believe it. That settles it. He's been with me for 50 something years now since 1966. Yeah. Baptized. Holy Ghost in 1967. Always with me. Always with me. Okay. In closing, as Jesus' earthly ministry and mission became, began to come to a close, the culmination of rejection began to set in. And in St. John 6, 6, 6, uh oh, 3, 6, 6, 6, 6 through 6, 8. That's John, St. John 6, start with verse 66, 6, 6, 6, okay, <laughs> 6, 8. We read, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. At one time, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? He said, he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He said, you have no life in you. They said, well, this is a hard saying. How can we eat this flesh? You know Corn thinking, okay, corn thinking. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? In other words, are you going to reject me? Right. Oh, you're going to reject me. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You know what he says, but I have the words of eternal life. Where are we going to go, Lord? We're not going to reject you. We're going to stay with you. Yeah. Though they did temporarily. Yeah. And now we see the ultimate rejection recorded in Matthew 27. Turn right there to St. Matthew 27. Then after that, I'll be going to St. Matthew 7. But right now, Matthew 27, as Jesus is suspended between heaven and earth, <clears throat> excuse me, after he has suffered the rejection of his own people, some of his closest friends and acquaintances, and all of a sudden he senses that his father has turned his back on him. And he cries, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. That is to say, I may not be pronouncing right, I'm not a Jew, but that's what it sounds like it says. That is to say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He felt rejected by his own father. He felt rejected. The reason he felt rejected was because I believe that was the last thing he had, he had to experience 
or feel that every human being that rejects God is going to feel when they stand before the judgment. They're going to feel that rejection, the ultimate rejection. The ultimate rejection when all these people uh, had done all they'd done, then he felt rejected by his own father, Amen. and he cried out. Amen. Jesus had to feel every, He had to feel that. He had to feel that. I felt that years ago. That's what brought me. That's what brought me in. Now I'm going to wind it up with this right here. I, I wrote on my notes. If time permits, I'll tell this dream because it's real short. <clears throat> I might have told it a long time ago. I don't remember, but for the record, I want to tell it. Amen. As a young man, when God called us, <clears throat> I had this dream of the night. The man talked to me about this baptism and everything. Uh, I, I, I get toward, I skipped some of the first ones there. We had went outside from his cafe and closed the Bible and everything and went out there. And I was at the crossroads of my life. I wanted to go to school to be a teacher and everything like that. And won the GI Bill. That's what I was trying to do. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't want to stay in a machine shop all my life. That's what it was. I was trying to be a teacher. That's what I want to do in school. And then the sky lit up. I told the story before. I had the light. It came down on me. like, And I saw people running in the hiding. I saw them running in the hiding. Because they're fixing to face God right there. I saw this. This light came down on me. I felt it, the heat of it. He spoke to me. Uh, I mean, he didn't speak to me. I just felt this heat from the light. And I, and I felt this feeling, what I'm talking about. I felt this feeling of being rejected. I felt this feeling of what every lost person. I was lost. I was lost. I didn't have the whole ghost. I wasn't born again. I felt this was the worst feeling I ever felt in my life. I felt God's coming and I'm lost. <laughs> Jesus felt, he said, he felt rejection of God. Every, every sinner is going to feel this rejection when they, in the end. I felt that feeling. I know what he felt out there. I felt the rege- feeling to be rejected of God. I spoke these four words. I said, is it too late? I knew I had to do something. Yeah. Is it too late? The boys came through my stepdad standing there and said, uh, now if you do it right now. Now if you do it right now, today. Get on me today. Now if you do it right now. Every head bow, would you stand? Amen. Musician, would you come up? We, we, I'm trying to make this short. I just feel like the Lord told me to do this. When I was thinking about this message, would a musician come up, wanted to play something something soft and kind of, amen. Every head bow and every eye closed, I want to ask you. I'm going to tell you, many of us have been rejected have been rejected by family. We've got children. Some of you have, I don't have. Some of you have children who go back to school. And if they talk about God, guess what? They're going to be rejected. No doubt. Even if they don't talk about God, they can be rejected. But amen. But if you feel like you just want, I know God's done touch. I know he has. He has he's done touch and move there. But I don't want anybody to feel what I felt that night in that dream. This, this, when God says, Matthew 7, 23, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. My, my, my. Hallelujah. Go ahead and play something softly. If you want to come pray, Pastor will pray for you. I know you've prayed, but if someone hadn't come pray, if you want to, you want to be here for just a minute, you're welcome to come pray. I'm not much on that. I don't have to do that very much, but I just felt that. And in closing, that's what it is. Hallelujah, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, we wind up the service where you're praying. I don't have to pray over you. I just worship God just for a few minutes there. scriptures come to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his thought and the unrighteous man his ways. Amen. Let him return unto the Lord for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Praise God. You gotta seek the Lord while he may be found. Praise God. If you don't take opportunity while it is afforded to you when you amen find your 
yourself in a place where you're in need of God. It'd be terrible not to be able to find Him then because He gives us the opportunity. Amen. Whenever they was out on the boat and Jesus came walking on the water, the Bible says He would have passed them by. But He relied upon them calling out to Him was near but it was dependent upon them calling out while he was near you see you don't go by your time frame we go by his time frame amen praise God amen amen brother Whitmire preached this morning Christianity is not a very convenient religion God doesn't wait until it's convenient for you. He'll call you at a most inconvenient time. Amen. And you've got to come. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Lord Jesus, would you help us tonight? I, I thank you for this word that we've heard tonight, God.